the ingredient that's missing in our lives is compassion. We need compassion, all of us, especially those of us who are leading in the Lord's work, compassion. I want you to hear a message by a most compassionate man on the compassion of Christ for lost souls. And may God use it to stir your soul to a deeper compassion for the lost. I knew when I invited these men to come with us, these are men that, is, that have been greatly used of God. And I'm, I'm thrilled how the Lord has used them here. And I, I remember him speaking for Dr. John R. Rice, Dr. Robertson, I have had talks about Dr. Paisley when he spoke for Dr. Robertson years ago. Dr. Robertson said it was a tremendous blessing to the church there at Highland Park. I wanted them to come because I thought we could be a blessing and encouragement to them. I want them to know how much we appreciate their stand for the Lord. We need this. And we, we are grateful for them and for their ministry. And I also knew they'd be a tremendous blessing to us. And my, my, can you imagine? It's already exceeded my expectation. I had a high expectation. But I've told my wife every evening late as we've talked and every morning early as we've prepared for the day. Only God knows what's been done in my heart. How much I've been helped. And Dr. Paisley, I want to thank you again for coming. A long, long way, but you've been more of a blessing than you can ever imagine. And may God use you mightily as you come to preach today. Thank God. Thank God. It is a great privilege to always preach the Word of God. There's nothing special about me. I'm just plain jailbird that's out of prison for the time being. And when I went to prison, I had a love for the criminals. And I started a gospel service every Lord's Day. The other services were still old ecumenical services, and nobody went to them. They wouldn't allow me to preach in the prison chapel because I wasn't good enough. But I preached in the basement, and the basements were packed with men. Packed with men. Souls were saved. And such a work commenced that the government of the country had to recognize it. And for the first time, they appointed free Presbyterian chaplains in every prison. And I had the last laugh at my enemies. You know, when you're in God's work, God helps you to laugh. And I have found that God's laugh is the loudest, and it's always the last laugh, the last laugh. It's a great thing to serve the Lord. It's a thrilling thing to serve the Lord. It can't be explained what it does to you. I was sitting there and they were singing, the Lord is here. You wouldn't want to be in better company than that, would you? The Lord is here. And when the Lord's here, something always happens. The Lord never goes away without doing something. He may give you a cuff in the ear and you need it. He may put his nail-pierced hand on your heart and bless God you'll feel it. The imprint will be there. Isn't it great to be seen? Shouldn't we be totally dedicated to get poor lost sinners away from the quagmire, away from the dirt of the world, and the damnation of iniquity, and get them to Christ. Let them meet the Savior. Let them get to know the greatest friend a person can have, 
and their lives will be changed. Praise God, and their homes will be rearranged when Jesus comes. This is what we should be about. And it's always a delight to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can assure you, you'll not need a dictionary to understand what I'm saying. You'll get it loud and clear, as plain as I can make it. Of course, I speak with the accent of heaven, because when everybody gets to heaven, they'll have an Ulster accent. You maybe didn't know that. Now, don't ask me the scripture that I get that in. Just leave it to eternity to reveal it to you. Let's turn uh, to Matthew chapter 9. The ninth chapter of Matthew and the verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And God will stamp with his own divine seal of approval, this reading from his own infallible book. Amen and amen. Let's stand for prayer. I take the promised Holy Ghost, the blessed power of Pentecost, to fill me to the uttermost, I take. Thank God he undertakes for me. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I feel constrained this morning to speak on the subject of Christ's compassion for lost souls. Christ's compassion for lost souls. And I bring to your attention the 36th verse of this ninth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Christ's compassion for lost souls. What a subject. Christ's compassion for lost souls. What a consideration. Christ's compassion for lost souls. What a consecration. Christ's compassion for lost souls. What a demonstration of divine reality. Christ's compassion for lost souls, what a thrice holy position. Christ's compassion for lost souls, what a thrice holy person. Christ's compassion for lost souls, what a thrice holy benediction. 
no preacher could ever describe adequately the compassion of the Son of God for the souls of lost men and women. I was thinking early this morning as I sat with my Bible and my notes and thought of this service, I thought that this was always the glory of the blessed Son of God. Away in eternity, before the hills in order stood, our earth received its freedom. In the council chambers of the everlasting angels, the blessed Son of God, in his place in the Holy Trinity of God, he had come passion for the souls of man. You know the love you're loved with, believer, never commenced and it'll never end. It's the everlasting love. He has loved us with everlasting love. The brightest gem that shone on the crown of Christ in eternity was the gem of compassion the gem of compassion. And then I thought of the post-creation era after man was made and man fell and we read they heard the Lord God walk in the garden. No, that's not what the book said. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. Who is the voice of the Lord God? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Hear that, you old Christless apostates. Our Savior is God. He's God. And he came into the garden, and what was the impulse in his heart. What compelled him to come? Compassion. Compassion on Adam and Eve. Fallen, deluded, deceived, and now depraved by the action of hell and the devil. But over against all the darkness of the power of hell. You can bring up the sunshine of the Lord's compassion. That chases away every cloud. That turns the night to day. You know, Adam shouldn't have called his wife the mother of all living because through sin death came. But Adam that day got saving faith. And my, when saving faith comes into your life, everything's changed. And instead of saying, poor Eve, the mother of all dying, he said, Eve, the mother of all living. For when Jesus comes, death flees. No place for death when Jesus is around. That's why the dying thieves could not die until Jesus died. As long as he lived, death was not the master. So they could only die. And no one ever dies in the presence of the living Christ. He is a living son of God. Compassion. And then I thought of the theophanies of the Old Testament the pre-incarnation appearances of our Lord Jesus. The first of the, one of them was, of course, in Eden's garden that I've referred to. The last one, I think, was the angel standing before the fallen, corrupted high priest. And he called for new garments. He called for making a new man of that high priest that was such a sinner. 
You'll maybe find something beyond that. But in every case, the impulse that was the full impulse of God's reason for another theophany was compassion. Was compassion. Well, what shall I do to say of the day when angels were overcome with wonder and when the father said goodbye to his lovely son in the hills of Emmanuel's land and Christ came to be born of a virgin to take into union with his deity our humanity to be made in the likeness, listen to it, the likeness of sinful flesh. Oh, the wonder of it. What drove him? What compelled him to come out of the ivory palaces into this world of woe? It was his compassion. It was that deep stirring of the eternal eternal depths that can't be measured of his everlasting love. And praise God, he came from the brightest of glory. His blood for a ransom he shed to purchase eternal redemption. And oh, he is mighty to see him. Maybe tucked away in this congregation, there is some person and you have sinned and sinned and sinned and the devil whispers in your ear every piercely saying it's not for you. There's no hope for you. The devil is a liar. Jesus saves to the very uttermost all that come unto God by him. Dear sinner, this morning I would like to say to you, Jesus can save you now. Call upon him. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call upon him. He will save you. Hallelujah. He will save you now. You can be saved now. And I think of all Christ's pre-cross experiences. And I look at his life. And it was all compassion. Compassion to those who abused him and cursed him and reviled him. Compassion for the lepers and the blind and the devil possessed. Compassion for everyone he met. And even when he saw the young man, he looked on him and it says he loved him. And then even when he knew what was going to happen to the city of Jerusalem, he still spent his tears to weep over the city. Oh, the compassion of the Savior's heart. And what about all the compassion that he manifested in his hours just before Calvary. I go to that sacred place called Gethsemane. I see underneath the trees there the God-man, the man Christ Jesus, preparing himself for the great battle of the cross. And I read in the book of Hebrews, who in the days of his flesh wrestled and prayed. You see, the devil wanted to kill the Lord Jesus in Gethsemane because he knew if Jesus got to the cross, he would be killed. So he said, I'll kill him before he gets there. Oh, the drops of blood that he sweated. Why did he sweat them? Compassion filled his soul. And that day in Calvary, he saw Ian Paisley in his sights. Wicked, sinful man that I was. 
And thank God he had compassion upon me. Oh, the wonder of it. Peter would have become another Judas, but he didn't. He became the chief of the apostles. Why? Because of Christ's compassion. I love that word that he said to Peter. Satan has desired to sift you, but I have prayed for you. He read the intent and desire of hell. And before the devil could bring it to fruition, thank God, Christ had mastered it through his compassion. His compassion. And when he was being kneeled to the cross, compassion overwhelmed him. And he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And when he hung on the cross, he said to the dying thief, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I as vile as he Wash all my sins away. There's power in the blood. For the blood was pushed through his wounds and pours by overwhelming, everlasting, eternal, undying compassion for the souls of men. And of course, when he rose from the dead, all his post-resurrection appearances were characterized by compassion. And he said, I will not leave thee comfortless. I will come to you. And you know, the Holy Spirit is here. What has been making these meetings? Not good preaching. The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit takes and helps the preacher to preach. And he might be an orator and he might know language and he might know theology, but he's useless till the Spirit comes. And the Spirit comes because the Lord has compassion and he especially has compassion on a poor free Presbyterian among Baptists. He has to have compassion on me. And thank God the compassion of the Lord never fails. Oh, aren't you glad you're saved? Aren't you glad you're washed in the blood of the Lamb? Aren't you glad you're in a separatist church that stands for the book and the blood and the blessed hope? Aren't you glad you've got a Savior whose compassion feels not, never will feel? Oh, it makes me happy today. Man said to me in the House of Commons, he said, I have watched you. Said, That's a good job you have. And he said, you know, I said this man's a hypocrite. We'll soon find him out when he becomes a member of the House of Commons. We'll find out he's just another one of those biving, thumbling hypocrites. But he says, Ian, I couldn't find anything wrong with you. I said, no, not because of anything in me, but because the Lord saved me. And one night... In the House of Commons, a lot of MPs got round me after a debate. And the Lord gave me some liberty to speak to them. And there was a wee man there whom I never thought had anything to do with religion at all. I know what he kept saying. Keep at them in. Let them have it. Let them have it. Keep at them. Keep at them. And I felt like saying, I need to keep at you first. Get you converted. Oh, let me tell you, Christ has compassion. I want you to get that into your heart tonight. He's a compassionate Savior. On the throne, what he's doing, he's showing his compassion. You know what he lives to do? To pray for you. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. You know, people say to me, I'll pray for you. And I say, thank you very much. But I wonder, do they pray for me? I know many people do. Thank God for every one. 
We had an old revival preacher in our country, W.P. Nicholson, and he used to say, I don't want your silver, I want your supplication. I'm greedy for your supplications. Pray for me. Oh, we need the prayers of the saints, but we've got the prayers of the Lord Jesus, a compassionate Lord Jesus. And he's coming back again. And he's going to demonstrate his compassion when he brings all the saints in. When the saints go marching in. Are you not looking forward to that day? Oh, it'll be great to be in step with heaven and not out of step with heaven. If you're a lost soul, you'll be out of step on that day. And the day for heaven for the saints will be for eternal hell for sinners lost. But we cannot leave you lost and low. We want you over there. Friend, come to Christ today. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you. Hallelujah. He will save you now. Now believe it or not, that's the introduction to this sermon. So you should be happy that that's just the introduction. But I could sit down now and say amen, and you have enough for all the days of your life just thinking of the compassion of the Lord. But the thrust of my message is today that you need that compassion imparted to you. Christ has no hands but your hands. He has no tongue but your tongue. He has no service but the service that you can give him. And he wants every one of us to enter into his compassionate ministry and to have a heart that's soft. I pray every day, Lord, keep me from hard-heartedness. Keep me soft and tender. Keep me with a tear for the men and women around me that are going down to the darkness of the damned. And if I don't see my congregation see them, I'll see them in the fires of a lost eternity. And I cannot bear the thought, good, decent men and women, but they're lost. Oh, for a love to love them into the arms of Jesus. Only Jesus can give you that love. Oh, for a compassion that will be out of breath like John Wesley running after souls. Oh, for a love that goes stronger and goes deeper and grows tougher as these evil days develop. We need that compassion brethren and sisters in Christ. And if this church is going to take this city, if it's compassion, if it is a compassionate church, it'll do it. You can't stand before Christ's compassion. There's not a wall of hell's building will stand when Christ's compassion grips the church. I tell you, this is what I need as a preacher. And this is what you need as a Christian worker, the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was a compulsive compassion. When Christ saw the multitude, no, when Christ saw the multitudes, Christ had no stingy view. He saw it all. I know if God would show you all the sinners in your locality, even if he showed you all the sinners in your own street, you would have enough to weep for until the Lord calls you home. Compassion. This compulse of compassion. You know when Jesus Christ showed his compassion, a change came over the disciples. When the world saw his compassion, a strange silence 
silence the voice of criticism. Christ is supreme. He reigns as the compassionate Christ. Oh, blessed, compassionate Christ, come into my heart and reign in my heart. Give me thoughts of compassion for lost souls. Give me compassion to weep o'er the erring one, to lift up the fallen, to tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Help me to remember that there go I, but for the grace of God. If God had not called me, I would probably this night be in hell. But thank God he loved me, and he convicted me, and he called me, and one day he saved me, and he has kept me ever since. And I have been crooked and awkward. And I have been worldly and sinful. And I've failed him. But he has never failed me. And I am what I am. What? By the grace of God. The grace, the free grace of Almighty God can change you, dear sinner, now. And make you a new creature in Christ. He also can surprise you at your own self. When God does that, we'll never forget the wonder of it all. The wonder of it all. Compulsive compassion. I pray God that God will give us compulsion, compulsive compassion. You see, that compassion of Christ, it got him to stand still on the Jericho Road while everybody else wanted to join in the march. He stood still. Why? Because there was a blind Bartimaeus and he needed to see. And the Lord Jesus waited and he gave him sight. And the first thing Bartimaeus saw with his new eyes and new sight was the blessed Jesus. And my, when God saves you, the first thing you'll see is the Lord. You'll not see the pastor or the preacher or the church. Hallelujah. You'll see Jesus. And you'll sing and shout the victory. Oh, yes. The compassion of Jesus doesn't pass by on the other side. The compassion of Jesus, like the good Samaritan, comes to where the sinners are. And that's what we have to do. We have to go to get the sinners. You remember Christ took the deaf man with an impediment in the speech outside the city. And he got his ears unstopped and he got his eyes opened and his deafness taken away. And it says he spoke plainly. I love that. A real convert speaks plainly. He doesn't be fanciful. He just tells the truth. I found the Savior, but better than that, the Savior has found me. Oh, the wonder of it all. But notice, secondly, this was contemplative compassion. The Lord looked, and as he looked, on the multitude, he was moved with compassion. I tell you, the person that has compassion will never be unemployed. He'll always be moved. He'll always be moved. Move every preacher I know that loves the souls of men. He's always moving. He's always thinking out new ways to reach more. He's never content with his lot. He wants to see an old-fashioned, heaven-sent, sky-blue revival that'll shake his district, shake his church, and shake his own soul. Count contemplative compassion. Christ saw the multitudes, and he said, I will give my Lord, my precious blood for their redemption. He saw them as lost souls. 
They were liable to assaults within and without. They were like frail ships, ready to be broken in the storm. They were like travelers on an express train that had lost the guiding hand of the man that should have controlled what was happening. And they were heading for ruin. But thank God, when Jesus comes aboard, he saves men from the wrecks. And he saves men from the runaway express. And he saves them for instant disaster. The value of a human soul, what is its value? Well, we're more valuable than the sun that sends its light every day to this earth. We're more valuable than the moon that reflects the light of the sun. You know, Jesus Christ gave us the rates of exchange for our soul. And he said, you can have the whole world, but if you lose your own soul, it's a bad bargain. Oh, sinner, today, let me tell you, your soul has been measured in the rate of exchange by Christ. His compassion upon you. Amen. And he sees that your soul is worth every drop of his crimson blood. Amen. He went to Calvary. Yes. Not only to shed his blood, but to shed it all that you might be saved by his death. But this compassion is also compulsive. It rises up in God's, in Christ's heart, and then it is contemplative, but it is not only contemplative and compulsive, but thank God it's concentrated. You know, I see th three things here. When I look at this text, I see that the sheep were sick. They were fainting. I see they were scattered. They needed a shepherd. And I see not only that, but they were shepherdless. They were sick. They were scattered. And they were shepherdless but the compassion of Christ healed their sickness. The compassion of Christ brought them all together to the great shepherd's fold. And the compassion of Christ did away with them being scattered abroad, a sheep without a shepherd. None of the righteous ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night when the Lord passed through, ere he found the sheep that was lost. It was a sick sheep. It was a straying sheep. It was a shepherdless sheep. But out in the desert, he heard its cry, sick and helpless and ready to die. But it didn't die because compassion was strong enough and gracious enough and powerful enough to find the sheep, to cure the sheep of its sickness, to bring it into the fold and give it a shepherd forever. You know, I always think of the sheep, the shepherd taking that little lost lamb and putting it upon his shoulders. And I read an old Puritan preacher and he said, he put its mouth at his own ear as he laid it on the shoulders. For he wanted that lamb to know that he wanted to communicate with it. And that's what the Lord does to all of us who know him. He talks to us. People say to me, you talk very familiarly to God. Why shouldn't I? I'm his child. And he's delighted to hear my cry. He doesn't want you to come with a a dictionary and use the big words. God wants you to be a child 
A little child shall lead them. And what the church needs is a baptism of childlikeness, not childishness, but childlikeness, so that we believe and we know the Father hears his Son. He gives his Son everything. I know that the Father heareth me. This compassion, I believe, is contagious. I believe if you get a few compassionate church members, it'll spread among others. They'll see the difference. They'll say, those people have joy. Those people are eager. Those people are not careless. Those people have something I have. I want this compulsion. And it spreads. And I pray God will give us an epidemic of this compulsion in our hearts. That every member of the church will want to win souls for Christ. He'll not say, I'll leave it to the pastor. No, be a soul winner yourself. Yes, and the most encouraging thing is to the preacher when a member of his church comes and says, I want a soul for Jesus. I want a soul for Jesus. And I always say to him, well, go and get another one. Yes, you know. And it'll even be greater joy. I had a, a man in my congregation who used to bring people to the church. And you know what he would say to me? He would hit me on the shoulder when we were praying before the meeting. He would say, I have 14 in tonight. You better preach well. Yes, 14. And I said, I'll not say I'll preach well, but you pray that God will use me. And one by one, everybody brought to the church. He got them all see it, every one of them. Some of them stuck the preacher for six months and some a year, but at the end, they cracked. God cracked them. Why? Because it was a man with compassion on his heart and his soul. Jesus shed tears, O oh, wondrous grace. Teardrops steamed that radiant face. Heavenly gems that sparkling tell. Love that would save from judgment and from hell. Jesus shed tears, such bitter tears. Wonder of wonders, think of it. Jesus shed tears for me. Let us start shedding tears for the lost ones. That child of your mother, you mother, keep weeping for that child. Unanswered yet, the prayers your lips have offered in agony of heart these many years. Does hope begin to fail? Does faith begin to falter? And think you all in vain those falling tears? Say not, the Father hath not heard your prayer. You shall have your desire sometime, somewhere. Jesus never resists the tears of his people. May God help us to have a good weep over the souls of men. And when we start weeping, sinners will start to weep. When you get the, the saints confessing their sins, then sinners start confessing their sins. If you get the saints praying, the sinners will start to pray. If you get the saints weeping, the sinners will start to weep. It's contagious, this compassion. Oh, may the Lord help us to take heed to ourselves. And last of all, it is challenging compassion. Look how the chapter ends. The Lord shows the disciples the harvest. All those disciples thought the harvest was just yellow. But the Lord said it's overripe. It's white. And the harvest around this church is overripe. It's ready for the sickle. You need to hurry. Because we have not much time left to get them in. Oh, may the Lord of the harvest out of these meetings thrust forth laborers into the harvest field. And if this meeting does nothing less than give you a heart's desire to pray for the compassion of Christ to be registered in your inmost soul, then I believe great things will be done in the name of the Holy Child Jesus. We're privileged 
to be allowed to be partners with Christ in the harvest field. Go and reap my brother, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. God bless you. Amen.